So, let's talk to the other people around here. How is that money? sense. Bastards! We have a right to work! The man yells toward the harbor gates. His voice is the loudest of the lot and oddly screechy for a man his size. So this is a couple of people uh, workers protesting in front of the harbor gates and what's going on here of course is that the union, the Debardieu's union led by Everett and Edgar Clare is striking against wild pines not only for better working conditions but indeed for collectivization, right? They want wild pines to become an employee owned company and in order to do that, they're striking. And in this case, that means not only are they not working, and um, you probably know how a strike work, works like, right? A strike is worked by a, is organized by a union. And um, the union is a, uh, an asso association of workers that decides to go on strike democratically. And when they do, um, the union members stop working and if they stop working obviously the company doesn't have to pay them any longer um, they usually there's uh, legislation against just firing striking workers but of course for the duration the workers aren't working the company doesn't have to pay them so what happens is that the union pays the workers for the duration of the strike which is the reason that unions have to collect dues right because in the case of a strike, they have to have a strike fund uh, where they finance the workers' continued absence from work. And basically, this is a collective bargaining technique where the union is saying, okay, the strike costs us money. We do have a few reserves due to our union dues that we've collected over the past. And we're going to be paying the workers. And we're counting on the company's workers not working hurting the company more than it hurts our strike fund, right? So basically that's the power struggle that's going on with every strike. Um, and this works, and it's very much so a um, confirmation basically of leftist analysis, of socialist analysis of capital labor relations. The reason this works, because you should you should expect that this probably won't work, right? Because how many dues can a union collect, really? Um, maybe like one, two, three, four percent of a wor worker's wages when they're working, but not usually more. So even if the majority of the time the workers are working, even if they're working like 90% of the time, a strike can't last for very long, right? For a u before a union strike fund will run out. And wouldn't the company, who is financed by capitalists who have a lot of money, have much larger reserves and be able to last much longer, which would make, which would make striking obsolete, right? But striking actually does work, um, surprisingly so, and surprisingly fast a lot of the times, uh, which is one of the reasons why so many right-wing governments and governments who are acting in the interests of uh, the capitalists come down very ha hard on both like u unions and make it harder for unions to form. They come down hard on strikes often um, in not so in like in the not so distant past police were sometimes used to break up strikes and to kill and injure workers who were going on strike um, to force them back to work basically with violence because the, the capitalists are so afraid of strikes because they are so effective and the reason they are so effective, uh, effective is because left wing assessment of a left wing assessment of the capital labor relations is correct right and that assessment is that basically what the capitalist is doing is just using their money to create more money or not really providing that much of value, right? 
what's creating the value in the end in a society, in an, in an economy, and in a company is the workers. Most of it. 99% of it. I don't know. I don't want to quantify it. But the lion's share of why corporations can be profitable is not, you know, innovation or um, the ability uh, to come up with a lot of, like, starting capital. Um, it's not the as conservatives call them, job creators that actually contribute so much to the functioning of a company, it's the workers and their labor. And uh, obviously what a sociali socialist analysis is saying is that the labor of workers is exploited um, because they're being pay paid, their wages are far lower than uh, they should be getting uh, when looking at the wealth they're creating, right? Cr every worker creates so much more wealth than they are paid uh, um, that the only way to describe this is really exploitation. And the only reason the capitalists can get away with it is because the workers are dependent on their wages, right? The workers, if they lose their work, if they're really fired, especially in a in a system where the safety net isn't very strong, where you maybe lose your health insurance, like in the US currently, or where generally the safety net isn't very good, you have a very bad bargaining position as a worker. You can't say, I want more, wo I want more uh, money for my labor, um, because the capitalist can just say, okay, I'm going to fire you, I'm going to hire someone else, and then you're go just going to have no health insurance, or you're going to die from hunger, or whatever. So you're going to end up working for a lot less than what you actually do. And unions are a way of counterbalancing this, right? Of giving the workers an option to say, okay, we have this strike fund, we can um, stop working for a little while and uh, threaten to not go back to work unless you pay us more or conditions improve in, improve in other ways. And again, this was quite the big um, quite the long way of introducing uh, uh, this concept now, but um, that's basically the reason why strikes work so well, right? Is because the difference between what a worker is paid and the wealth they're producing for the comp company is so high that, you know, the company can, uh, the, the union can pay the workers their wages for a couple of months, uh, or even just part of their wages, um, while the company is losing a lot more money, because all the work that uh, the workers are not doing is not just worth what the company is usually paying them, it's worth a lot more. And that explains the discrepancy, right? Even though the company, the capitalists, have a lot more money than a union ever will, they're losing more money through a strike too than the workers are, because in a normal situation the workers are so underpaid. And I find this so fascinating because it's like a real world um, uh, it's a real world um, basically it's the real world agreeing with leftist analysis. Strikes wouldn't work so well if that wasn't the case. Strike, strikes wouldn't work so well if employers wouldn't l lose massive amounts of monies by workers not working. Much more than they're paying them. Uh, so yeah, uh, right. So what's happened? Uh, I'm still at the analysis level of this of this situation. So <sighs> the union striking, and it's not only uh, telling its members not to work, but it's actually barricaded the harbor here too. They've closed the gate, as you can see. No, ca no one can get in. Um, all the lorries, which are basically um, coaches, right, trucks. All the trucks that are in this traffic jam, they're standing there because they can't get into the harbor. Um, not only because the union members aren't working, but because they've actively blocked the gate. So they've not only stopped working, they've al they're also keeping other workers from being able to do their work, which is a strategy, right? It's a stri strike strategy uh, to increase the union's leverage because if it's not only the union members that are not working, but also other workers who wouldn't be part of the union or, or who aren't even part of the company, 
then the strike becomes even more threatening to this company and to other companies. Um, this coincidentally is a like leftist strike tactic or has been historically very much so um, is not only stopping to work but also blockades and even more threateningly general strikes or solidarity strikes where workers are not only striking for better pay and working conditions and safety conditions in their own company but they're also striking in support of workers from another company and uh, if when this happens and it spreads like white wildfire and the workers are like conscious of their power there and are soli solidaristic with one another this can get out of hand very quick and by get out of hand I mean become very awesome very fast because that just forces the capitalists to their knees in no time right um, and that's also because one of the reasons why capitalists and governments who act in their interests or right-wing right -wing governments they're very much so opposed to unions and striking but what they're even more opposed to is solid solidaristic or general strikes and often governments crack down on those the hardest and in a lot of places there's even laws against uh, against general strikes or political strikes or solidaristic strikes and striking is like very much uh, contained to um, your own union and your own workplace you aren't allowed to do like blockade so much um, you can't stop working that's that right to strike is enshrined in most democracies uh, to some degree but striking on a larger level, striking, striking in solidarity with other workers or striking in solidarity with a political cause, I mean, this is where it gets even more. Y y y you notice me getting going here. Uh, there, but this is where it gets even more exciting. If workers not only start to uh, strike for their own interests, um, not only start to strike for other workers' interests in solidarity, but start to strike for more general political causes, um, then this tool becomes immensely powerful. And once again, the reason it's so powerful is, is because workers not working means massive losses for the capitalists, uh, which gives you an idea of how much labor is really worth. Um, right, so last thing that's pertinent to this discussion is these guys that are in front of the w the gate here and specifically this guy are strike breakers so what strike breakers are are usually workers that are um, not part of the union or if they're part of the union then they may be voted against the strike um, which can happen, you know, unions sometimes only like 90% or even like six, 60, 70, 75. Usually it's pretty um, one-sided, but sometimes there's a couple of workers who won't know, right? For different reasons, maybe because they're afraid that they'll lose their jobs or um, they have been threatened by like company goons or whatever, or they've, they've been like instigated by outside um, um, company activists um, activists ca paid by the company who are active against the strike all of these things can be true um, it can also be workers who just want to work because they want their wages right because even though the union is paying the workers from their strike fund uh, what the workers are getting is usually a bit less than their what they would be getting when they were working so um, some workers might be okay that might just be 10 or 20 percent cut from my salary but i can't afford that at all so i want to be working so i don't want to like make it too easy right like not every strike breaker has like bad intentions um i would still say it's like unsolidaristic and in the long run they they're hurting themselves the some themselves the most but in a sh in a short-term scenario there might sometimes be um reasons where you can at least understand where strike breakers or um, as they're also called uh, usually by the striking workers 
uh, scabs. Scabs is a bit of a derogatory term for strike breakers. So these people are scabs or strike breakers, right? And they're obviously led by this one very large dude who seems weirdly out of place. And of course, this is already an indication that the game's giving us here uh, that this strike breaker movement, people who want to work despite the strike going on, which would weaken the strike, right? Because the, the power the strike has is uh, the workers not working, which has the company losing money. And if there's a small number, a growing number, a significant number of workers who do actually work despite the strike, then the power of the strike decreases. So they're hurting the strike here. And this is obviously not like an entirely natural movement of just disaffected workers who want to work, but this is obviously instigated from the outside, right? Probably by people who were paid by the company because they want the strike to lose its power. And this seems like very much like a suspicious guy who says like right and right to work is like a conservative buzzword in the US as well, right? There's right to work legislation which makes forming unions or striking harder usually and there's like a right to work ethic which is basically strike breaker saying no, do I, I don't want to strike. I want to keep licking the boot of my company to just become a little bit uh, <laughs> polemic here. So, how do we deal with this scab leader? Uh, I am the law. Hold up and stay frosty, everyone. Cops are here. And um, scabs, and especially organized or company instigated scabs, are usually pretty pro cop, right? Because. And. Like, depending on how much you know about history and union and strike history, this might come as used to you or news to you or not. But historically, especially in the United States and in other Western countries, the police has been notoriously anti-union and anti-worker. Except when it comes to the police union, but that's an entirely different matter, of course, right? Because the police union fights for police interests. But generally, against other workers, cops have been very much so deployed, specifically by right-wing governments, but also by centrist governments, to break strikes and force strikers back to work, as I said earlier. So strike breakers, they don't usually need to fear a lot from cops. They might have, like, depending how your union is organized, and if it's, like... Um, I mean, the concept of a union is a good one, but there can be corrupt unions too, like there can be corrupt people in every walk of life, right? Depending how bad your union is, strike breakers might also have something to fear from the union, and there might be um, people the union employs to intimidate strike breakers, um, but strike breakers don't usually have anything to fear from cops. Actually, it's quite the opposite. Usually union members and striking people um, uh have all all reason to uh, like have a lot of reason to be afraid of cops um because cops uh, his have historically been on orders from the high ups uh, very very violent against striking workers you here to fuck with us beat the honest worker down and this is such a you know this is such a like conservative talking point or rhetor rhetor rhetorical trick that he's doing where he's presenting the strike breakers as you know the poor honest worker who ha workers who have no power um, when what they're doing is of course systematic systematically weakening the bargaining positions of the workers vis-a-vis -vis the company uh, no good we're fighting for a cause here right to work right to work was well, yeah so anti-union anti-strike um, politics and violence has such a long and storied history that it's gone through like lots of permutations uh, over the centuries and millennia really right because if you want to, you can go all the way back to Spartacus and the Romans, and probably even before that. But that's like 
the best um, records we have is often of the Romans, where um, slaves are, of course, um, also massively Im exploited. And in the Roman Republic, they didn't have, like, you know, any legislation that allowed slaves to strike or whatever. If slaves stopped working, they were just, like, either butchered or forced b back to work through violence, right? But if things got too far, and this, if the slaves, like, um, created, like, enough of a consciousness and of a collective uh, that was able to fight back, there could be slave revolts, right? Which is basically a more violent form of a strike, where the slaves were just saying, okay, we're going to stop working for you. You're literally exploiting us. And because we know that you're going to react to violence with that, we have to take it upon ourselves to arm us. And that's exact, uh, arm ourselves. And that's exact, exactly what hap happened with uh, Spartacus, which is the most prominent one, but with all slave revolts, really. Um, who, in the end, they were always crushed by forces of the state. Um, but if you, if you will, this is like a very early form of like strike breaking of the state reacting with violence to their underpaid, or in the case of slaves, completely unpaid laborers refusing to work. Um, cracking down on that hard, and with like the harshest uh, form of violence the state can muster, has a very long tradition. Uh, because, yeah, in a, in, a, in a society that's built on underpaying or not paying a large amount of your workforce, um, things even at the top can start to crumble very fast if um, those people you exploit start realizing what's going on and start realizing that they have some form of power if they act collectively. Um, Spartacus is also a diff uh, like an interesting example, uh, by the way, because a lot of um, left-wing movements, more so in the late 19th, 19th and 19th and early 20th century, um, call themselves after S Spartacus, right? Specifically in Germany, in post-World War One Germany, in the Weimar Republic, they were a lot of uh, Spartacusbünde. And they existed even after the Second World War II. Um, I know a lot of the like left-wing ecosphere ecos that my parents grew up in, in the, you know, 60s and 70s. Uh, there were some Spartakisten as well, which means like Spartacists, who very much like uh, carried forward this idea of... Um, yeah, even the most uh, exploited and underpaid in society have a lot of power if they band together. And refusing to work is one of their like sh sharpest weapons. One of the sharpest uh, weapons in their arsenal. Um, so yeah, uh, you, can, you can trace like labor relations all the way back to the Romans. And obviously like modern labor conditions in many Western countries are protected a lot better than those of the slaves were in the Roman Republic, but the general organizing principle remains the same. And even today, like a lot of labor that is done, and maybe to a lesser degree in industrialized nations, even though we underestimate that too, but certainly to a big degree in the Global South, a lot of those labor relations are like either outright slavery, actually slavery still exists today in staggering numbers, or they're approaching s slavery to a degree where people can barely afford even their own room and board from the low wages they're getting, right? And um, seeing that like a lot of the products almost all of the products, a lot of the products we consume in our day-to-day -day life um, in the Global North, they're produced at those conditions in the Global South, and that's the only reason we can afford them with our standard of living, right? Which I wouldn't say makes us responsible, but again, a leftist critique is always a systematic critique, and I, like, 
I can't help but criticize a system where the only way that my standard of living is even possible is because workers in other parts of the world are treated like shit. That's like, it's not like I'm responsible for that um, or I should just stop living my life or whatever. But it means that I can, or I, I have to, like, really radically um, question the system we're living under and ask myself, like, is there another way um, of treating workers everywhere better? And um, obviously, as long as there's a lot of money to be made with the system the way it is, there's going to be very much, like, there's going to be a lot of resistance to things changing significantly. So, you know, like, going back to the slaves, uh, when it comes to the origins of modern labor relations, is not as far-fetched as you, th as, you, as you might think. I mean, even in Europe, the way, like, a lot of our food is produced, even. A lot of our vegetables are picked with, you know, undocumented labor and lots of labor safety violations in, in Spain and they employ, like, undocumented um, undocumented immigrants and treat them, like, very badly. They have to work without protective gear. Um, they're exposed to all the pesticides. They have to wa work in the sun for way too long uh, at very grave hazards to their health, right? And that's the only reason that fruit and vegetables are as affordable as they are oftentimes in countries like mine, like Germany. And the same is true for the US and um, and uh, agriculture there. So it's still very much so a screwed up system. And a left-wing perspective is always internationalist, you know. It's always humanist. It wants to abolish classes and states. And it looks at people everywhere in the world and it says, yeah, workers everywhere are treated like shit. And there are some places where they're treated even worse. But that's not, you know, because those places are just less developed or anything than we are. But it's because our standard of living actively necessitates these people being treated like shit. Um, and not only our standard of living, but more importantly, the profits of, uh, of the capitalist class. So, yeah. International solidarity and all that. <laughs> uh, don't be a scab. Join a union now. We're fighting for a cause here. Yeah, you're fighting for a cause of disempowering workers. Besides, we're not that different. It helps if people see us talking, cops and strike breakers together. Shows authorities are yeah. on our side. They usually are Builds on confidence. your side. What kind of cause are we talking about? Rights of people, rights of workers. Rights of to workers. Have gainful employment, mm. to make a salary, and feed their families. This reminds me of a reminds me of a slogan by the Conservative Party, the CDU in Germany here, which I'm not sure which election campaign it was. I think it was either in the 2000s or in the 90s, where the Conservative Party had the slogan. Uh, or one of the slogans was Sozialist was Arbeit schafft. And uh, ba uh, uh, to, to just translate very quickly, in English this means um, the most social thing you can do is create jobs. <laughs> and uh, that obviously mirrors conservatives... Uh, uh, oh, I almost said propaganda. Conservatives talking points in, in the United States too, right? But they're saying like, yeah, job creators and everything. We, we need to treat job creators right um, so they can create jobs and that's the most social thing to do. And um, obviously, having a job doesn't mean shit if it doesn't pay enough for you to live. Um, you might as well be on unemployment then a lot of the time. Or it's just like, you know, slightly better. So, what's actually social is not just creating any job, um, but is create sustainable jobs that you can live on. Uh, 
But that's not such a pithy slogan, I suppose. Sozialist was Arbeitschaft. CDU slogan from the 90s or 2000s. Uh, I don't think I've chosen any sides yet. Might be time. Don't let the fat bastards tread on you. Cops tend to side with the higher-ups, but you're essentially still workers. This is such a nefarious way of, of arguing. And again, it's so well written uh, by the uh, writers here. Um, cops tend to side with the higher-ups, which is true, of course. But he's casting himself as not a higher up, right? Even though, as we're going to find out later, he's literally a mercenary paid by the company. And uh, uh, not just a worker who wants to work. But even if he were, like, you know, strike breakers are not the underdog. <laughs> strike breakers are siding with the company against... Even if there might, like, be short term reasons for them to do what they're doing but essentially and in the long term what they're doing is siding with the company against their fellow workers and he's like trying to turn that around rhetorically right he's very smart uh, in that way and he's obviously had these talking points like thought through before and fed to him um, by people who do this kind of public relationship uh, thing for a living so Cops tend to side with the higher ups. Yeah, that's why I'm usually siding with strike strike breakers. But we're essentially still workers, and that's, I mean, that's another nefar bit of a nefarious argument um, that I feel was more prevalent on the left, or at least more prevalent, like f for me, a couple of years ago, before Black Lives Matter, more spe specifically, where I was like, okay, so. My maxim is like a structural critique, but I want to be empathetic with people, especially with working class people. And aren't cops like in danger a lot of the time? They're not well paid. They're also like selling their labor. Aren't they just workers too? Um, and I think the left in general, or maybe it was just me a couple of years ago, probably also because I'm white, were like... I was like a little bit in that direction. I was never, never like the biggest fan of the police as an institution, but individual cops, I was more like, okay, cut, cut them some slack. Um, then, of course, like the entire left-wing discussion changed a lot, for me at least. I mean, maybe it was different in, in uh, circles that are not, not as wide as mine before that too, but for me the discussion changed where it became um, pretty unacceptable in left-wing circles to say stuff like cops are workers too and um, I tend to agree I really develop my position on this I'm like yeah in this like very you know um, simplified vision version of like class analysis where there's you know capitalists and workers which is still true and valid um, for the most part nowadays I, th I think but which has also been extrapolated upon, like not, it hasn't been like really contradicted by Marxist, new, newer Marxist th thought, but it has been developed and complicated a bit more. It's still, of course, important to know the original concept. Um, but, while, but while that still holds true, that general d analysis, there's also some nuance to it. And one is, for example, that cops, while in the technical sense workers, very much act as a, in reality, as a enforcement arm of the system we live under, right? That's not even like a radical idea. That's what, like, um, uh, the role of cops is, um, the self-described role of cops even. It's to enforce violence on, on, um, on, um, enforce violence for the state basically and if you're like not critical of the system at all or you could you could say like it's a democracy there needs to be a monopoly of violence or whatever but if your analysis is that essentially we're living in a capitalist system where the lion's share of power even though the system purports to be democratic but really the lion's share of power through lobbying and outright corruption of politicians and whatever lies with uh, capitalists structurally then the enforcing arm of that system 
obviously also generally enforces the interests of the capitalist class, right? More so than the working class. And um, this is very, very true historically. Um, as I said, when it came to strikes, um, especially in, in the in the U.S. in the night and in the, in the U.K. and other parts of Europe in the 1930s, um, cops were like twenties, 1910s, twenties, thirties were notoriously violent against strikers. Broke up strikes all the time, you know, like f Ford. Um, uh, there was like s several big unions and strikes in in Ford's factories, and they were like very brutally put put down. But even nowadays, like, y you, like, it happens quickly that you're dis decried, like, as a populist or whatever when you say this. But look at, like, law enforcement nowadays. How often do you really see people at the, if you want, like, top of the food chain go to jail for crimes? It happens way less commonly. If you look at, like, the ex U.S. is always an extreme example. But, I mean, okay, there's Bernie Madoff, and there's, like, one or two figures in, like, finance who've gone to jail over the last, like, 20, 30 years. Um, but generally, the U.S. prison population uh, is basically entirely made up of working-class people. And that's not because working-class people just commit more crimes, but they commit... Firstly, they commit different crimes, which aren't worse. A lot of the times, the crimes that are committed in the financial world have much larger effects like on a grand scale, right? Um, but they commit different crimes and they're treated differently both by the police and by the carceral system. Um, there's a very strong tendency towards incarcerating working class people in the US and even more so working class people from um, uh, uh, people of color, working class people of color, right? So um, the massive prison population that the U.S. that the U.S. Ha has, and uh, it is massive. Every fourth, I couldn't believe this. I read this statistic the other day. But every fourth prisoner on planet Earth is in prison in the United States, which is mind blowing to me. Seeing that the U.S. has like less than five percent of the world's population but uh, over 20% of the world's prison population and um, yeah so and yeah and that's what I wanted to say and the prison population is um, almost exclusively working class and as I said before the working class is a lot bigger than the capitalist class but even accounting for that People from the capitalist, capitalist class rarely, if ever, go to prison. And um, that's not because they don't commit any crimes. They commit crimes like tax evasion, tax fraud, um, fraud in general, all the time. Uh, at at least the same rate that working class people do. But they very rarely go to prison for it. Where in the United States, you can go to, life f uh, go to prison for life if you have if you live like in a s state with a three strikes rule right and you smoke marijuana three times or whatever and you're like okay you're away for life and um yeah as i said the us is always the, the the most extreme example but it's a very clear example of how like both policing and the carceral system is not geared towards jailing capitalists it's geared towards um jailing working class people So yeah, that's why um, like a lot of leftist uh, thought nowadays probably wouldn't say that, yeah, cops are just workers just like any other. Well, they are in a technical sense, but they're also the enforcement agency of capital. One of the enforcement agencies. I don't trust cops, but I can mm. see you understand the Right to work! Right to work! Maybe you should ask them the questions, like why we're not allowed to make a living here. Shame on you! We have families to feed, you piece of shit. So do we, Scott. 
What is a strike? When a bunch of ungrateful, lazy <laughs> cockroaches can't get their act together, decide to block honest work for other people. I mean, this is ob obviously also rhetoric, but it's not as good of a rhetorical device as his earlier ones were. Beats me. They mumble nonsense about boardrooms and workers' rights, while we have the right to work! When the man moves around, you perceive some serious abs underneath his tight-fitting shirt. Like, yeah. This man is in shape. Like he was trained to fight. <laughs> How come you're built like a brick shit house, but the other skips, scabs are so scrawny? I work hard, and I would work even harder if the fuckers would let us work. What exactly is your goal here? We were promised work. We'd be in there working if the bastards hadn't shut the gates. He points to the gates. And you are unable to breach the entrance? Main gate's locked. Would take heavy ordnance to bust it open. Could try to get in through the secretary's office. Door is locked. The guards blocking the way to the access panel. And I don't mean the scrawny mess punk either. I mean head measurer. Wait, head measurer? Whatever he is. Huge Semenes guy standing up there on the overhead passage. Won't let anyone by. The access panel is right behind him. How bad could one guy be? You seem capable. Bad. Standing on a narrow bridge, he's got a strategically advantageous position. And he's trained. I don't know how the Union has a trained killer up there. But that one's no joke. And my men are tired and hungry. They're workers, not fighters. Have you considered storming in like all of you? Why don't you? Go arrest them instead. Good idea. I'm sure, they've done plenty of criminal shit. They have that look. It would be better for the neighborhood if you went home, at least for now. If you can't get in anyway. No. They will give up eventually, or get drunk. Leave the button unguarded. Then we charge. Oh, the button, right? Who are all these strike breakers? Honest men and women with rights. To work, to be useful, not toys for corporate interests. He's turning it all around. You're the toys for corporate interests right now. How are the union members striking for better working conditions, toys of corporate interests? They're striking against the company. He's rhetorically uh, quite adept, I must say. The man runs a hand through a steadily graying military haircut. Military haircut, you say? We came here to help the harbor run smoothly in time of crisis. If union fucks don't want work, they ought to let in those who do want work. I have a question. Why do all these men follow your leadership? You think they follow because I'm big and loud? No. They follow the rules of the that market. That giveaway. The rules of the economy. Because they were... Given a job to do! <laughs> like he's... He's always shouting these... Uh, certain phrases like he's learned them and he wants them to really catch on, right? You've been talking to him for quite a while now. Something is off with this guy. Yeah. Ask him where he's from. What's it to you? Big mess caused by union greed. But I only fight for the rights of people. Choose a very distrustful look. Already got that. I'm interested in your background. We're all workers, right? Workers stick together. Came from the eminent domain in Jamrock. Backgrounds in odd jobs, heavy lifting, cargo hauling, bouncer work. I know the drill. A monstrous shadow high above the fire traps of the domain. The 881 motorway running over this district of Jamrock. Concrete pillars rise up from the midst of the dilapidated wooden houses on the horizon. Barely visible, the hazy machinery of the harbor. Shut and breathe on your hands. Life in the domain is even worse off than in Martinez. Mm. The cold air is stiff from the fumes of the motor carriages and lorries roaring overhead. Below, broken down, battered people mill on the dusty streets with no purpose. Yet amongst them, there is no sight of this man. 
nowhere. Bouncer, where? I frequent a lot of bars. Maybe it's one I know. Quartet. Territorial. Ring a bell. Never heard of it. Are you lying? We're done here. I have a strike oh. to break. He squints at you. A little spark of violence gutters in his eyes. Then he blinks and turns to his man. That's a shame. I feel like I messed up here somehow. Maybe I could have could have gotten more out of him. But enough for that talk, for now. And uh, that's actually a good point. It's a bit early, but it's a good point to take another break. Thanks everyone for watching my long talk about unions and workers' rights and international solidarity. I'll see you next time. Bye bye.